Hi, I'm your host, Jared Gross, and thanks for joining us on The Community Producers, a monthly show produced by community volunteers like myself. We begin this month with Dennis Walker, who's joined in studio by a member of the group trying to build an indoor sports facility in Cranbrook. Mike Robinson joins us here today to get the one up on everything that's happening with this multi-use facility they've been both fundraising for and trying to find land for. Mike, how are you? Not too bad, how are you? Good, how's the project coming along? Uh, it's coming along very well. We, we've always assumed a certain level of community support with it, but to see it actually being realized is uh, beyond even what we had hoped for. I guess there's been practices indoors for everything from soccer and a whole bunch of other sports where you'd like to be indoors because it's hard to get a competitive edge in sports when you can't be outside 12 months of the year, isn't there? Oh, certainly, yeah, yeah. Working with the schools and being in those gyms is, is making do with, with the best that we have at the time, but the facilities for your field-based sports are looking for something larger, like, the, like a field like this. So lacrosse, baseball, soccer, those types of sports definitely benefit from having the, the larger space. What's the plan to keep it heated in the cold winter months and maintain it year round. Have you done a lot of research on this already? You bet, yeah. A lot of it comes from directly from the dome manufacturer. They have these across Canada. Um, closest to us would be one that was built in, in Kelowna in uh, around, I believe, 2012. And so they, they've been tried and tested in similar climates and, and fare quite well. To try and get sponsorship money, who do you go to? I mean, it takes a little bit of an effort to do that. How long has that process been going on? Uh, again, surprisingly quick. We're very grateful to say that um, we, we, had, we had a timeline in mind originally, more s six months to a year type of thing, but the, uh, the fundraising was, was achieved quite quickly, under six months, and you go around to community members. There's some that were, uh, you can, the, the town can sort of consistently count on, but there's a lot of surprising private donors that also have come out. The multi-use facilities I've been in are generally three quarters the size of a soccer pitch. Do you have any kind of dimensions for us at this time or will that vary as we go along? Yeah, yeah, so so designs always have the potential until until it's we, we issue the final designs. There's, there's a bit more time here to uh, where designs can change, but the current concept is 40 meters by 60 meters. So anyone familiar with the Moyer Park, when you go up there, the, the, the older kids will be playing the full length field. If you're there with a U10 or U11 team, you'll see they turn the field sideways, split the large one. It's, it's equal to one of those. Um, in terms of other facilities, spaces in town, it's three and a half times the Mount Baker High School gym. I know that sometimes hiring people to run these facilities. I mean, this is going to happen down the road as well. How many people do you think it will take to run this multi-use facility when we get it up and running here in Cranbrook? We expect to have the general, the overall administration rolled into a position through KISA, through Youth Soccer Association, but uh, I'd expect anywhere from three to five part-time, sort of a student type position, somebody there actually on site with every hour that the facility is open. What would go into maintaining a multi-use sports facility? I mean, obviously you have to clean it, you have to make sure that the, the surface is groomed every day. Yeah. yeah, you bet. So there's two types of turf. There's filled and non-filled. The filled type are what you'd see um, a lot, lot of the professional teams playing. So that has the sand and rubber fill that can get moved around within the turf itself. So there's grooming essentially and filling in uh, sort of the higher use spots. Non-filled turf, very simple, uh, once a year, kind of a steam cleaning type, type treatment. The dome itself is relatively maintenance free. Um, beyond that, it's, it's pretty much just like you say, your standard janitorial. Can you get some of the lighting or most of it just through natural light or not? Or would you have to get a lot of lighting in there? Yeah. this this design that we've gone with, it's all, it's all LED lighting, so uh, low, low consumptive lighting. There are designs out there that uh, we've seen with, the, with skylights on them, so they actually will let in some natural lighting. It's a balance between heating and electrical, though what you, you're gaining with your, with your heat, or with, the, with letting the light in, you're actually losing a bit of the heat. So we've gone with what they have recommended and have shown in, like I say, in, in comparable 
comparable communities. I'm thinking with the canvas top, I suppose you could put clear sections in it. I'm not sure how they could do that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. You can go and see the different designs that this company's built and they do that, have that where there's large strips down the middle of, of completely transparent co cover there, so. Right, April's right around the corner and of course we'll get into spring and summer where everybody's active outside. How much groundwork can you cover for this multi-use facility and is there like a rough timeline when you'd like to get shovels digging and get things going on it then? Yeah, yeah, so entering the, the field season is great. That um, gets, gets people out and playing on, on, the, on the grass, on those surfaces, and it allows for construction to actually take place. It's remarkably fast. The, the amount of groundwork that we would be doing locally is the in, installing essentially the, a, a large foundation and a base within that, a crushed base. The, the turf uh, manufacturer comes in and installs that in about 14 days we were quoted and then the uh, the dome itself goes up again remarkably fast within 10 days they said from the time they show up to when they they hand you the keys. If perchance a sponsorship group or organization wants to help physically will there be opportunities for that along the way? I guess you've got to have professionals putting up a structure like this but do you think you'll be asking for volunteer labor at any time? There's, there's definitely the chance. I mean we want to keep it as grassroots as possible. Um, supervision of the, of the entire construction will be provided by uh, New Dawn Developments, the title sponsor for the, for the entire project. Uh, the dome manufacturer will come in and supervise installation but again there's, there's chances there for, uh, for some laboring needs as well. Good information. Thank you for joining us on the Community Producers today. All right. Thank you very much. Mike Robinson is the main spearheader of this project, a multi-use facility for Cranbrook. Up next, a very special donation, which is helping kids in Fernie get back on the ice. This NHL-sized outdoor rink has been vital to the community of Fernie, a community which is still recovering from a tragic ammonia leak which would claim the lives of three people and shut down the city's only ice surface until further notice. There's still a lot of sorrow because we lost two really great, uh, fantastic uh, workers from the city of Fernie and one really great contractor. It's going to be something that we're going to remember forever and ever. In the wake of the tragedy, the Calgary Flames Foundation would reach out to city officials to donate the boards, chain link fencing and benches, as well as additional funding to aid in the construction and upkeep of the rink, a total donation of more than $100,000 extremely sad and tragic what happened there and Fernie is we believe right in our backyard and there's lots of people from Calgary who have homes there and it's taking care of our rural areas is something that is a priority for us and that was just the right thing to do. Prior to the arrival of the outdoor rink, those displaced were required to travel back and forth to surrounding communities for ice time. We were told that some of the children were dropping out of the minor hockey and the figure skating because of the commute to uh, neighboring communities. For the Flames Foundation, the Fernie Project is exactly the kind of thing they're looking to contribute to. We're trying to facilitate access uh, to sport and to hockey uh, through programming that give kids and you know people the chance to play. So part of that is making sure that we have safe spaces to do so and um, rinks are obviously a huge part of that. Following the announcement in late November, the rink would come together in just over three weeks, thanks to the Fernie Lions Club who took the lead on the project and the generosity of the many local businesses who would donate equipment and manpower. We were dumbfounded. I mean, this is a huge gift, having the Calgary Flames offer these boards and then having the community just come together and so quickly put it up it was really pretty amazing. Since the rink opened December 21st, Local user groups have been taking full advantage of the new surface. It's also been a hit for young kids and parents. It's fabulous to, you know, to be, have outside time, it's fun, it's really accessible in the daytime for kids that aren't at school. It gets us outside, we get to enjoy it. Uh, my son plays Timbits as well, so we've used it for practices. I don't even want to think what it would have been like if we didn't have this rink because it has brought people together. It has given them a place to go back and do what was being done at the Fernie Arena. For eight-year-old Lincoln Philpotts, who's been one of those traveling to and from Sparwood for hockey, 
The new rink has been a welcomed addition and a new experience. You get to be outside instead of inside, and you get to be on fresh ice. You're out here. You're looking at the scenery around us, which is, you know, phenomenal. It really is. And you're getting fresh air, and there's just something to being outside that is special. There are still a few loose ends to tie up before the rink becomes a permanent fixture, but Mayor Giuliano is determined to see it stay. If I have anything to do with it, let me tell you, we're going to keep this one because I think it's great for Fernie to have an indoor and an outdoor arena. For the community producers in Fernie, I'm Leila Gross. A new facility in Cranbrook is providing local producers the opportunity to rent a fully functional commercial kitchen. In June 2017, Siobhan Stapleton began making homemade matcha beverages. When her drinks became a hit at local farmers markets, she decided to add cold brew coffee and kombucha to the menu and her house began to fill up. Things are getting stacked up by my pantry. I have fermentations all over my kitchen counter. They've now migrated into my office. Luckily for Staplin, the Community Connection Society in Cranbrook was working on Farm Kitchen, a collaborative working space designed for food-focused entrepreneurs. For a small producer like myself, just sort of getting my feet wet, you know, with farmers markets and producing a product part-time, to have a commercial kitchen available to use is incredible. Well, that was identified as a need um, for those farmers market vendors, especially farmers market vendors who want to start growing their business. If I was to, um, you know, try and build a facility like this myself, it would be absolutely out of my um, ability to do so. The kitchen, which was originally budgeted for $85,000, soon grew to a total of $150,000 and includes a walk-in cooler and freezer, a six-burner commercial gas stove, a sanitizing dishwasher, commercial food processor, blender and equipment storage space. Project coordinator Sophie Larson says there remains a shopping list of items they'd like to add. On the top of that list is a commercial baking oven. Um, we'd also like to add a vacuum sealer and possibly a bottler and labeler. As for Staplin, she can't wait to begin sharing the space with others. I really hope that more and more of the farmers market people, local producers or anybody with a uh, food entrepreneur idea will utilize this facility. Just having that opportunity to work with other local producers is going to be fantastic. We know that entrepreneurs add to economic growth, but we also see it as a uh, food security project. The more we can support local food in our community, be it growing or producing. The kitchen includes a front of house seating area which can also be rented. For more information, visit farmkitchenconnect.ca. For the community producers in Cranbrook, I'm Jeremy Russin. Welcome back. Up next, the story of a young Cranbrook boy who's hoping to provide some warmth and comfort for sick children and those in need. What about a brown hat band? Six-year-old Elias Quick mm -hmm. knows firsthand the impact a comforting blanket can have. Born a month and a half premature, Quick spent periods of his childhood in and out of hospital with his own blanket by his side. I think that it was really important for him because it was something that could be with him all the time when he was sick. Um, even places that I couldn't go, his fuzzy blanket could go. And so that was kind of, it took that place of helping him calm down and, and be feel safe. Now he's on a mission to share that comforting feeling with other kids thanks to his Fuzzy Blankets for All campaign. We were taking Elias's little sister to daycare and we drove by the hospital and Elias looked out his window and said that he would really like every kid that was in the hospital and that had to stay in a hospital bed to have a fuzzy blanket like he did so that they could be comfortable. And then he said he wanted kids that didn't have homes to also have um, fuzzy blankets. It just popped in my head. 
it was really neat that he he had this idea that he came up with all on his own and he was so excited about it and he just really wanted other kids to feel happy and comfortable. With help from his mother, Elias began selling cookies, toys, and also created a GoFundMe campaign, using the proceeds to produce their first 50 blankets, 40 for Alberta Children's Hospital, and another 10 for the Kootenai Haven Transition House in Cranbrook. In Cranbrook, we don't have a lot of kids that are living necessarily on the streets, but we do have kids that come from tough situations that have to leave their homes suddenly. I think it's really impactful that someone their own age cares enough about them and understands their situation well enough that they would want to do something like that. Just over a month in, the operation would get a boost as GoFundMe would recognize Elias's effort by donating an extra thousand dollars to his cause. I told him what had happened and that somebody thought that he was doing a great job and that this this big organization had acknowledged him by giving him some money and that was more money than we had raised in total so far. Now with enough material on the way to create another 200 fuzzy blankets, the sky's the limit for this little kid with a big heart. It's been a really great experience for Elias and really neat that we're able to give some some comfort to some kids that are going through hard times. It makes me feel happy. For more on Elias and his campaign, visit GoFundMe.com slash Blankies. That's B-L-A-N-K-I-E-S. For the Community Producers in Cranbrook, I'm Jared Gross. Finally this month, Dennis Walker pays a visit to the bakery at Fort Steel Heritage Town. We're at Fort Steele Bakery today with Shauna Bolak, who's been here how many years now? I've been here since 2001. Did you think you'd be here this long when you first started? No, I didn't, but I have really enjoyed it and I hope to put in many more years. Where did you learn to bake, Shauna? Just by being on site here then? Um, yes, as my kids would say, you know, growing up, uh, I never, you know, baked scra from scratch growing up for the kids, but uh, I decided to take on this role about four years ago in the bakery and the best thing I ever did. It's, I would call it, a high personality bakery. My goodness, who works with a setting like this? I know, it's a wonderful place. People can see in the background the big stove. Yes. What's it like firing that up every day and a little bit about the big oven then? Um, well, it's, I guess that's what makes my job really unique is uh, ha working with a wood oven. Um, when people do come in, we actually give them tours. So they don't just stand at the front here. We will take them in the back and show them around and show them exactly what we do. But with the size of it, mm -hmm. how do you heat it up and have consistently even heat with an oven that size? Um, I would just say it's just taken practice. Um, what we do in the morning is we um, load it up with about, I don't know, 15 to 18 pieces of wood. We get it to a temperature of about 600 degrees, 700 degrees. The reason we want to get it to that high temperature is because we want to heat those bricks and keep them heated throughout the day so we can bake in it. So once the um, um, wood starts to burn down, then we uh, just blow the ashes to the back and then we start baking in it. Part of your job though is not just baking on site and selling on site, you're quite mobile too, aren't you? Yeah, just recently we actually um, pur purchased a vehicle. Um, it's a Fort Steel van and we actually do deliveries as well. So we do wholesale, retail and fundraising. Yeah, let's talk about fundraising. How can people get their organization as a part of your fundraisers? Um, they basically just call Fort Steel and, um, and uh, I'll be glad to sit with them and come up with some ideas for them how to raise money for their organization. I guess when you're targeting the May long weekend, the September long weekend is most due and it's preparation time for that right now. What are the, the target times? I know you've got Father's Day is always mm -hmm. a very busy one here. International tourists. Yeah. What's the setting like in the people you talk to here? You must meet some really interesting people. I think that's the other thing I like about the job here at Fort Steel. You really don't see too many people twice. You know, um, yeah. you get those world travelers coming in, and um, I'm a person I like to sit and chat with people too and hear their story just like they like to hear ours. So. Right, and you must meet people that were bakers, maybe retired bakers, yes. or in the industry. They like to look around. Yes. What have you learned from others that are in your trade? Um, I basically have learned that um, because I'm a, a fairly new baker myself, um, they come in and they, I show them around. They haven't worked with a wood oven before though, usually. Usually they're working with more modern technology. So I think it's a nice feeling for myself when they come in and they're just wowed like, oh my, you cook in this wood oven. And I think it's a good feeling uh, just knowing that I'm doing something just a little different that they, than they would have probably done. International tourists though, do you speak to lots? 
Oh, very much so. Yes, we have people from all over the world that come here to Fort Steele. Outside of these doors, I'm sure they keep you busy in here anyway. Mm -hmm. They were working on the hotel all last winter. It's going to be nice in the summertime, isn't oh, it? Oh, definitely. Yeah, the, the Windsor will be, uh, is, uh, work, we're working on it becoming a bed and breakfast and um, should be really exciting. And will you be supplying some product to that as yes, well? Yes, we will. We will. Uh, in the mornings, we'll supply some probably muffins, scones, cinnamon buns. It must be hard to keep up an energy all the time. It's hard baking. You've got to be up probably just after midnight. What's the daily routine for you, Shauna? Um, well, for ourselves, when I first took on the bakery, I wanted a bakery that um, you saw the bakers throughout the day. So we don't have bakers that work through the night. Our bakers will start anywhere between, say, 5 or 6 in the morning, and we'll actually work during the day. So when people come into the front doors, they actually see bakers in the back actually working. How old is this building? Um, this building is only, it was built in the early 90s, so it's not that old. Are some of the bread and cinnamon bun recipes, are they from the time they as aren't. your clothing are today? I, no, no, um, no yes. they're not. Um, the um, sour starter that we use, though, um, for our sourdough bread, it's been going since, I, I would say, at least 25 years um, now. And so we just keep adding to it. So... Um, yeah, so that's what we do with the sourdough starter. What do you think is the most famous item that you sell here? I would probably say our cinnamon buns, right. um, and then probably our bread, and then we have our new, um, um, it's called a smoky roll-up that I designed about two, three years ago. And uh, we have apple, uh, apple pie uh, bars, and so we've got a few that are, are pretty close, but cinnamon buns are definitely number one. <laughs> the assembly line here and Donna was showing mm -hmm. me earlier and thank you to her for that we mm -hmm. went downstairs but uh, Donna was saying they used to take the flour and fire it down on a ramp downstairs right. yeah. you changed that a little bit can you describe that well to us? yeah we used to uh, fire all the product down the stairs but because the bakery has grown so much and we're open all year round now doing production um, it just made no sense that we were going down there in our skirts and trucking back up the stairs with the bags of flour and stuff. So we've created space upstairs now so we don't have to go down the stairs. How many years do you think you can keep doing this for? Well, I hope for many more. I've really enjoyed it. Really good. Yeah. Thank you for your time. You're open at what time every day then? Um, so 10 to 4. Um, we are, um, this time of year, you know, more in the off season, we will be um, not in full production with everything out front, but we will have some items uh, for sale. And, um, and then what's uh, May comes will be in full production again right through until October. Are you hiring? Do you, you do yes. hire in the summertime for extra help too, yeah. don't you? Yeah, anyone that's looking for work for Fort Steele, they can contact Fort Steele. They better have a lot of energy and be ready to work then, I would think. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Shauna Bolak has been here for 17 years and we get a nice tour around it. You can probably see in the background the great setting here at Fort Steele in the, in the bakery. That's all the time we have here on this episode of the Community Producers. I'm Jared Gross, thanks for watching.